welcome to the Brain and Transcranial Photobiomodulation Virtual Summit. Uh, over the past 30 years, research has linked moderate to severe traumatic brain injury like concussions to a greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia later in life, years after the original head injury. Today we have Dr. Trent Nichols uh, with us. He's spent six years researching the magnetic field therapy effects on gene regulation and five years in trials on neuroscience and photomodulation working on Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, and post-concussion syndrome with the Quiet Mind Foundation. He's probably the only neurogastroenterologist interested in photobiomodulation. His topic today is near-infrared LED and QEEG neurofeedback for TBI and post-concussion syndrome, implications for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's risk. Thank you for attending and presenting today, Trent. Thank you for having me. Trent, can you tell me, uh, how did you get started in your research uh, as far as the brain and transcranial photobiomodulation? Well, I've, I've always been interested in, in the brain. Uh, I actually thought of being a neurologist um, or even a neuro-ophthalmologist, but decided that was uh, not quite where I wanted to be at that time because uh, this is back in, I graduated in 69 out of medical school. I was in the Navy for uh, four years as an active duty military officer, as a, as, as a physician, and actually helped with actually alcohol drug rehab, as well as other general things. I was on a ship, I was on a flagship, uh, was at two naval hospitals, Great Lakes, and also Naples, and became involved with kind of understanding chronic addiction and pain. So that was uh, one area. I got into gastroenterology because it was the only field that really at those days could actually visualize what was going on at the cellular level or the lining level and all that in the entire intestine. We could see the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. We could do uh, examinations of the liver with laparoscopy and we could also put photo, uh, photo uh, imaging areas into the, uh, by doing biopsies, actually into even the pancreas and the ERCP. So that's what I went into. And then uh, I did pharmaceutical studies uh, towards the latter part of my career, did 58 pharmaceutical studies with various leading uh, major drug firms and just kind of felt like, gee, all these drugs are wonderful, but they all have side effects. Uh, they, I saw so much polypharmacy after I started working at the VA. And I just decided that I needed to um, do some research and uh, found that we needed a home therapy because we knew the large magnets were by taking down inflammation, increasing blood flow, doing gene up and down regulation, which took us about six years to realize. But we didn't have any home therapy because these things were the size of open MRIs. And I'm going to show they weighed three tons. They took a lot of energy to run them, 220 volts. And you actually had to have your own. Uh, Big uh, DC converter downstairs in the basement. Oops, just got so, so I, that's why I got into photobiomodulation after I met Marvin. And he, you I met Marvin, and you started that you were interested in this because it was a uh, more economical. They could get it at home. People could correct. use it. So you found it to be a more active therapy. That's correct. And you you actually are. The, a a researcher, also a clinical researcher. You set up the trials. Yeah, I, I help with Marvin. We, we go through and uh, when we made out all these applications, uh, which we're now using, actually, he's got uh, a, a study that which is nearing completion down at, at, with him yeah, up in uh, Elkin Park in Quiet Mine and also down at the Baylor Scott White Temple, Temple, Texas, with Jason Wang. Yeah, where they're actually doing close to, uh, I think, 80 to 100 subjects with, with early to mid dementia from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And they also got funded by the Brain Institute, the David Clark Brain Institute now. It's hard to read, but it shows primary blast effect, which hits the spinal cord, goes up the spinal cord to the brain. Then you have a secondary blast effect coming from the foot with the blast. And then the tertiary is what happens to the residual, where you actually sort of have a, a counter coup with both the occipital and the frontal lobes. Brain concussion associated with TBI and post-concussion syndrome. Just kind of go through a high force impact on any side of the brain operates a shock wave, which passes through the brain and bounces off the skull. 
the brain impact on the site of the skull results in bruising of the brain and inflammation. And in high force impact, tearing and twisting of the blood vessels in the brain can cause nerve damage. And of course, the immediate effects are concussion, loss of consciousness, nausea, ringing in the ears, and concussion. Delayed effects are headache, irritability, sleep disorder, trouble, trouble of memory, poor concentration, depression. Uh, and obviously the military is facing a growing traumatic brain injury caseload. You can see that it's gone up over the last, uh, this is actually just goes up to about 10 years here, but it's estimated anywhere about 30,000. Uh, here's just a history of multiple sports concussions and traumatic brain injury, showing what happens with a football player that's being tackled and this, the uh, helmet's being knocked off and he has a concussion and has to be taken out of the game. And late, years later, these subjects are much higher risk for both Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and the immediate effect, of, which is a, a little bit different with the, what they call PA, is actually CTE. And that can even occur within eight to 10 years and that these guys uh, often wind up uh, donating their brains up for a suicidal attempt or a, more of an attempt to the uh, brain, by, brain Institute in Harvard who's studying this. Okay, background, impaired cognition is the most important of these is the post-concussion syndrome and traumatic brain injury. injury. Uh, over the 30 years, um, one key study shows that the older adults of a history of multiple traumatic brain injury had a 2.3 times greater risk of developing severe traumatic brain injury uh, of Alzheimer's and with no history. And with the history of severe traumatic brain injury where they actually had a coma, they had a 4.5 times greater risk. And does every uh, hit to the head lead to dementia? No, not everyone. And so there's emerging evidence showing that individuals who experience repeated traumatic brain injury or multiple blows to the head about loss of consciousness, such as professional athletes, combat veterans, they're at the higher risk of getting CTE. Current research on CTE shows that they have changes in brain chemistry indicating the relationship between traumatic brain injury and hallmark protein uh, abnormalities, beta amyloid and TA, linked to Alzheimer's. And some research suggests that TBI may be likely to cause dementia in individuals who have a variety of a gene for ApoE, E4. And then there's also some re research now that shows that they may have a problem of methylation, that they can have what they call MTHFR, and, uh, which is a methylation gene defect as well as COMT. Okay, so this just shows a closed head, closed head injury with a countercoup injury to the head. This just shows the mechanism of cognitive dysfunction following TBI, which is the concussion or hematoma, diffuse, axonal strain, com compromised. Secondary systemic complications, edema, increased hemorrhage, leading to uh, cerebral blood flow, leading to ischemia, and several secondary uh, mechanisms, which is exocytosphysicity, calcium overload, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, which is what we're actually dealing with when we're doing photobiomodulation and taking down inflammation, uh, as well as synaptic dysfunction, um, cell death, and axonal degeneration leading to cognitive decline and dysfunction. Here's a slide showing that uh, the damaged neuron and the microglia, and you've got release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, chemokines, MAP-1, MCP-1, and exocytoxins, glutamate, aspartate, and quinolinic acid. The model uh, mechanism modulating am amyloid beta and TA pathology following injury follows this starting out with traumatic brain injury at the top, glutamate, synaptic M MNDA activation with increased in soluble amyloid beta and increased intercellular calcium, and then mitochondrial oxidative stress, which uh, Dr. Uh, Hamlin's been so good at talking about and recognizing cytochrome C caspase uh, inflammation going down to uh, BACE, cap culpain and calineurin. Uh, These are all the calcium side coming down here, causing uh, cleave ta, uh, also spine cord loss, synaptic transmission. Then it goes to cap A3, finally to cell death, neuron synaptic loss, cleave ta, and neurofibrillary tangles. 
and that would be the CTE and, 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 and dementia. So you can see again, this is just sort of a schematic saying the same thing, but on, on a more of an inflammatory basis of necrosis and a cell of calcium oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, the major things in blade cell death. So factors, what we'll get across that is also a, there, there's a thing called a dopamine hypothesis. This comes from Bales, and it just shows that dopamine and monoamine oxidase and dopamine transport are a result in chronic increase in what we call tyrosine hydroxylase. You have chronic decrease in that and increased tissue DA, followed by chronic decrease in the invoked release, and you also have danger from that. From that. Now, another thing, this shows hyperphosphated tau. This is how I kind of actually got into this. I was actually asked to write a review paper about uh, five years ago on hyperphosphorylation of tau. And that was only because I had done some research in, uh, not really in pre-Alzheimer's, actually in people with Down syndrome. They're at much higher risk. If you live to be in your 50s or 60s with Downs, uh, you have about an 80% chance of having Alzheimer's. Uh, so hyperphosphylated TAS is also found, of course, in CTE and also Alzheimer's. But it's a little, there, there's a little bit of difference between the TAW tangles. And we won't go into that at this point. But there's a good review article, actually, in Nature, which came out in uh, 2019. But this shows that the, the uh, tubules that are in the brain actually destabilize and break down, and that forms a tangle, the tangled TAW. And you see the neurotubular subunits and the hyperphosphorylation, which causes from inflammation and damage with the deep, uh, functional neurotubular dys dysfunction. And this is just another synaptic dysfunction TBI. So Dr. Nasser, uh, Margaret Nasser, PhD, study at Jamaica Plains Boston Veterans Hospital was the first one to really use this to test the treatment of effective of red and near infrared light in Gulf War veterans many of whom had TBI, and she'll actually be speaking at this at a, in one of the symposiums. This showed what I was working with. This is a 0.5T uh, three-ton electromagnetic therapy called MME, malignant me 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 magnetic molecular energizer, two DC electromagnets with negative below, positive above, and the patient's head or body, whatever was hurting, would place on the gantry between the negative and below, positive, positive above, negative below. And this actually was very helpful, but the problem was it's something that had to be done like, like a, the size of an open MRI. And unfortunately, uh, there was no post therapy that we could use. We could you know, treat people for a week or so, five days, they'd come in with various problems. And it would help, we, we knew that we were getting increased flow, blood flow, we were getting reduction of pain, we were getting an increase in cognition, probably neurotransmission, neuro uh, receptors were helping we had people who were able to remember things that they couldn't do before but we didn't have a home therapy to follow up after they went home and that's what photobiomodulation was able to do so uh, again this is a little bit of uh, Nasser's study that showed that the red and near infrared LED therapy effectively reduces cognitive problems the consecutive functioning that goes up memory a verbal memory and chronic traumatic brain injuries even seven years post TBI. And probably due to increased cerebral blood flow, uh, it also helps in, in repeated head injuries. And she was found that it improved behavior post therapy. And it's again, it's because of the increase in the um, getting rid of the nitric trigger by release of nitric oxide. Uh, it's, after exposure to red and, and near infrared photons, it's been shown since 1981 that applied approximately 3% of near infrared photons applied to the scalp can penetrate uh, at least one centimeter deep to the brain, probably even up to three. And the mitochondria actually ha are able to contract each other, so you can even get better, a deeper uh, mitochondrial reach, even than, uh, than what this shows. And this is just a scheme showing that to some extent. Uh, mechanisms of action. Uh, Hamlin's group at uh, Wellman Institute has shown that cytochrome C oxidase is the last complex in the electron transport chain, saturated with nitric oxide, and that there's little ATP production to support needed energy for cellular function. This upregulates that. Cytochrome C oxidase is a photoacceptor for red or near for red light wave, wavelengths. And this just shows, again, a diagram from Dr. Hamlin showing the uh, increase in ATP 
Um, it's kind of confusing at first that the reactive oxygen species would be also elevated, but that's because he calls it has a Janus face. It's both when there's low grade activation, that's good, but when there's chronic excitation and chronic ROS, that's bad. And then this, again, is just showing this is the sort of the energy field on the mitochondria, showing the transcription, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, growth factors, and inflammatory mediators are, are regulated. Um, and after exposure to NIR, photons and red nitric oxides diffuse, where it promotes an increase in vasodilatation. We sort of went through this. And this has now been given the, used to be called low level uh, LLT, but now it's being referred to as photobiomodulation. And again, this just shows uh, a diagram showing stimulation, neurogenesis, and synaptogenesis, stimulation of endothelial cells, and indirect stimulations stimulation of circulatory cells and molecules. Uh, and what we've tried to do is set up a study with the, uh, for the NFL Wise Foundation. This is for people with traumatic brain injury and, and concussion uh, through uh, Wayne State and the Quiet Mind Foundation and Sunny. And uh, this subject was going to be independently, but patients had to be diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome, TBI, or CT by neurologists by means of the NIA. OA, it's a, it's a test. Patients would be excluded. There's multi part dementia or Parkinson's, um, and then Parkinson's it was obtained prior. And unfortunately, we were never able to get this off the ground for several reasons, partially because the NFL uh, was having a, a lot of, um, let's say, contractual and, and other legal things going on with their, with their players. And I think it, we were just about five to 10 years too soon and it never got off the ground. But I, I just, it, it's something that I, I think there, that ought to be looked at in the, in the near future. Um, and so it was gonna be a study of 136 or a three year clinical study with um, QEEG brain mapping and NRI spectroscopy. The subjects were to, under, were to undergo QEEG mapping and neurofeedback, which actually helps with plasticity. We were gonna use the Dougal helmet, uh, which is actually comes from Douglas Rex Dougal, who was a uh, physician in England and actually was the first one to describe using LED light rather than laser, consisting of his LEDs with modules and, uh, and uh, actually fans, which have to cool it down, which cover the foreskeleton and, and head, and it covers the frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital areas from front to back hairline, uh, including the vertex at five minute, for about five minutes for placement. And then also for home therapy, we're gonna use the Violite uh, for, which is actually from, uh, it's a helmet, or oh, actually it's a small 40 hertz helmet of four modules of nasal infrared light, which comes from Lulam up in Canada, which they use for 20 minutes each treatment day, every other day at home after uh, completion of the near infrared and neurobiomodulation in the office. And this total treatment was going to last 20 minutes every other day for two and a half years following the uh, office Dougal helmet therapy. Um, so we had it pretty well worked out. We're going to do double plus. We're not doing that now. We're even talking about it. Here's the inside of the Dougal near infrared helmet. Here is the neuropsychiatric uh, tr therapy that they're going to undergo the testing, verbal and visual test, finger tapping, symbol digits, stroop, color word at test, shifting intention, continuous performance test via CNS vital signs. It's a short form McGill pain questionnaire and the overall vast pain. And here's a person having uh, brain mapping for QEG, which Dr. Berman will go into more detail. Here's the NRI spectroscopy. Here's some of the neural network, just showing how um, on one day post-concussion, you can see that the area shrinks. This is actually just doing near infrared and QEG. And then this is showing the same thing right here. Here it also is pre and post QEG after neural feedback without um, photobiomodulation, showing that the delta power increases, which shows improved alertness, attention, alpha decreases with less anxiety, delta coherence, phase-like decrease, improved attention to focus. You can actually see that a lot of the red, a lot of the marks seem to, you know, for somebody like me who doesn't do all this time, you can see the improvement just symbolically with less busyness. And here's the home therapy. This is actually blue limbs, 
uh, with BioLite, near infrared helmet, and nasal light. So that was the proposal. We'd still like to see this go forward, especially since our research now on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, is being completed by the at uh, with Dr. Berman at Quiet Mind Foundation in Elkins Park, and also with uh, down at Temple, Texas at Baylor Scott White. Well, I can't hear you. Was this the uh, pre predecessor pre predecessor of the? Baylor Scott White type of study? Yes, it was. It, it, it was because uh, we went, we started out this at around 2015. And actually, we worked on it for at least two years. And we actually sent it to the military. We got turned down by the, the military. Well, the problem with the military is it's very difficult to do a study and get it in on time with all the preliminary stuff. Dr. Burma and I, we, we were three days late and get every, getting everything in from the initial that was our problem there and then with the with the uh, nfl the problem I, I said it was more of a trouble with the lawyers and the litigation that was going on and the michael j fox just wasn't interested they had done a previous study where they actually had uh, not with uh, near infrared light but they had a study using another modality which we were kind of interested in um, and uh, they didn't even, they, they were asked to do another uh, study after that and they didn't even follow up on that. So uh, I think you get one chance of these people and then yeah. they sort of go it's on good. to something else. You were able to launch this, you, you did the work, you did the study work so that it was easier to do it the next time and put this stuff in place. So from your perspective, and you're looking at the way that uh, energy fields interact with brain tissue, what would you say is the, is your, takeaway from transcranial photomyelodulation in the brain? What's your takeaway? Well, I, I think it, it's got tremendous potential. And I, in fact, I know it does. I actually have, I use it myself. I've got a, a Dougal and also I have one that I didn't show, which is the, uh, the red light, the laser jet from Capitalist to grow hair, because I mean, also, I'm growing more hair. It was down to where I hardly had anything. Uh, but yeah, and actually I'm getting more hair, but it's, it's very slow. But the, the reason that's nice, the capless helmet, well actually it's called a capless hat, uh, which has red, red laser jets. It's very, it doesn't need to have a cooler fan. It doesn't get that hot. You have to wait 10 minutes before you do it again. Um, and what's nice about it, it's all already FDA cleared. And I, we're thinking that probably the Dougal helmet would be best for the post you know, for using it in an office with, with medical supervision or the, somebody who's a PhD with a, with a license or, you know, who's in practice. And then for home therapy, uh, since the, since the Dougal helmet's about three times the cost, you can get a, you can get a capless anywhere from about $900 to 2000 to oh, high, almost 3000 And, um, it's, it's easy to recharge. It's, it has a small little, um, it has a nice little carrying case. And it's probably going to be, and I, I'm sure it penetrates at least a sonometer, they say a sonometer. Uh, so that maybe it doesn't go as far into the brain. And, and for Parkinson's, it doesn't have the um, ability to get the back of the scalp and over the occiput area. But it has, it has some potential to be used for other medical applications. Yeah. Well, there's several, there's several devices out there now uh, for uh, pancranial uh, placement of the LED. So that's positive. And, your um, word word of caution or anything you want to say to the to the to the to the scientists or the general public out there what they should pay attention to well I, I think you know what what we're being notified now for I, I, I work with several hospital systems I'm in um, with wellspan and also with um, the hospital locally in, in Hanover which is now part of UPMC they've all been taken over by bigger bigger groups and of course, they're really interested in getting, saving people's lives now with this COVID, the virus, you know, COVID-19, uh, which is a SARS virus. And I'll tell you what I think they're actually contacting me about now. It's not photobiomodulation, it's actually UV light, because what they want to be able to do is actually clean their surfaces, which are contaminated perhaps with the virus, and they want, to, they want some information on uh, UV light. And I had actually told them I actually had a, I still have a, in my office, a Viralux sanitizing wand. And uh, 
this thing, they would like to be able to, if we could get a bulb for it and get more of them, they would like to be able to sometimes re 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 get their surfaces without having to Clorox everything. And uh, they're interested in especially applying to people's masks and, their, and some of their scrubs, this type of thing. So I think the photobiomodulation societies and groups that understand this would maybe be able to help first by getting them safe UV light. And then eventually we can get them into the understanding that we can do a lot of probably non-chemical, but doing using what we call directed energy or dementia, traumatic brain injury, um, neurobiofeedback for psychological problems and psychiatric disorders. Uh, it's a way, to, it's a way to get in the door. Thank you for your overview, Dr. Ch Dr. Nichols. Thank you for being with us and sharing the, your uh, protocols with the, with us all. Uh, we show the best. We learned a lot about uh, post-concussion syndrome. We learned a lot about the CTE and how that can be affected and how that uh, transcranial photobiomodulation is going to have a positive effect on the brain and its outcomes. Thank you. Thank you.